If we took a poll among professional teachers of philosophy on the question, who is the most important living philosopher, it's not at all obvious, to me at least, who would get the most votes. But we can be fairly sure about some of the names that would be in the top half dozen. Quine, Popper, Jean-Paul Sartre, Chomsky probably, though strictly speaking he's not exactly a philosopher. Well, the first of those names, and one on which I'd lay pretty short odds, is that of Willard van Orman Quine, one of the professors of philosophy at Harvard. Quine was born in 1908 and is still highly productive, so he's had a long career and it's by no means over yet. He's published innumerable articles and over a dozen books, the best known of which are From a Logical Point of View, published in 1953, and Word and Object, published in 1960. First and foremost, he's a logician, and the original contributions to the subject which made him famous are for the most part highly technical and not really accessible to the layman, though they always had their ultimate roots in problems fundamental to philosophy. However, in the latter part of his career, he's become more overtly interested in philosophy in a more general sense. And I thought it would be uniquely valuable in this program to have a philosopher at the very summit of world reputation talking about the basics of philosophy and of his own activity. Professor Quine, what do you regard as the central task or tasks of philosophy? I think a philosophy is concerned with, the, with, the, the, with our knowledge of the world and the nature of the world. I, I, consider, I think a philosophy is attempting to round out the system of the world, as uh, Newton put it. There have been philosophers who have uh, thought of philosophy as somehow separate from science and uh, as providing a firm basis uh, on which to build science. But this, uh, I consider an empty dream. Science, much of science, is firmer than philosophy is or can even perhaps aspire to be. I think of philosophy as continuous with science, even as a part of science. Well, if it's continuous with science and even part of science, how does it differ from the rest of science? Uh, it, it differs in generality and in abstractness. Science uh, is a continuum extending from history and engineering and the, at one end, if we think of science broadly, uh, to such abstract pursuits as philosophy and mathematics at the other. Uh, philosophy uh, con uh, considers the, the question of the nature of cause, for instance, where physics uh, contents itself with defining causal relations between specific sorts of events, biology with, between other uh, sorts of events. Again, whereas the zoologist will tell us that there are wombats and the physicist will tell us that there are electrons, the mathematician will tell us there are no end of prime numbers. The philosopher is interested rather in what sorts of things there are altogether. In, it's in these ways that philosophy is more abstract in general. In other words, the philosopher is investigating what constitutes the connective tissue of everyone's thought, including other people's thought. So that the, the physicist is, is trying to find out uh, whether or not A causes B, but the philosopher is saying, well, but what does it mean to say that anything causes anything? Good. Uh, the physicist is trying to find out, say, what particular subatomic particles there are. Uh, and the philosopher says, but what does it mean to say of anything that it exists? Yes. It's at this level of complete generality that the philosopher's investigations occur. Is, exactly. is that right? Yes. Now, do you, uh, do you include in this, or do you exclude from it, the age-old questions of <coughs> how the world got here in the first place, or how life began? Uh, I exclude these from philosophy. Uh, how the world began uh, is a problem for the physicist and astronomer, and of course there have been conjectures from that quarter. How life began is a problem for the biologist, on which he's made notable progress in recent years. Why the world began, why life began, on the other hand, I think are, 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 are pseudo-questions, because I can't... Uh, um, I, I, I can't imagine what an answer would look like. And you think that because there's no conceivable answer to these questions, they are, so to speak, meaningless questions? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. So in other words, you regard the, the central tasks of philosophy as the analysis and elucidation of concepts that are central to various fields of human activity, and also, in particular, notions like 
core, what it is for something to be a cause of something else, what it is for something to exist, uh, what it is for something to be, shall we say, a scientific law, the most general notions that, that are, as it were, the connecting tissue of thought and that we have to use and have to employ in the specific activities that people like scientists, or it could even be politicians, lawyers, and so on, are engaged in. Is that, is that a correct way of putting your view? Yes, yes, I would agree with that. Do you think that the main or the most important questions that philosophers have to deal with can be grouped under any uh, particular headings? There are two headings, uh, <clears throat> uh, it, uh, which I think uh, uh, provide an important classification to begin with. Uh, there are the ontological questions, as they might be called. Well, I think you'll need to explain that term. Uh, these would be que <clears throat> questions as to what there is, yeah. the uh, general questions uh, as to what sorts of things there are, uh, as well as the question of what it means to exist, what, what it means to exist, uh, for there to be something. Um, and the other uh, classification, the other class, uh, would be, uh, might be called the, the predicated questions, um, questions as to what sorts of things can meaningfully be asked about what there is. In other words, you've got two enormous spheres of questioning here, one about what there is, and the other about what we can know about what there is, or what we can yes. say about what <clears throat> there yes. is. Yes, and now, epistemology would be included in the latter. Yes, yes, yes. Now, <clears throat> I think since you've made this distinction, for clarity's sake, in our discussion, we ought to cling to it a little, and I think we'll take these two areas one at a time, and we'll take your first one first, the whole group of questions about what there is, what exists, or as you say, what is called <clears throat> ontology by philosophers. Although there are innumerable theories about this, I think it's fair to say that throughout the history of the subject, there have been two broad opposing views in the matter of ontology between what you might very roughly call materialists and what you might call idealists. I mean, although there are innumerable different versions of both doctrines, you do have on the one hand a view that reality consists of matter or material objects in space and time which exist independently of anyone's or anything's experience of them. And on the other hand, you have a view of reality as consisting ultimately in spirits or minds, or is existing in the mind of God, or as being put together in our minds. Now, can I put very crudely the $64 question to you and ask you which side you're on? <clears throat> I'm on the materialist side. You're the materialist, you're materialist. Yes. yes. Yes, uh, yes uh, <clears throat> I hold that... Uh, Physical objects are real and exist externally to, uh, ex uh, and independently of us. Um, I don't hold that there are only these physical objects. There are uh, also abstract objects, um, objects of uh, uh, mathematics that seem to be needed to fill out the system of the world. Uh, but uh, I, don't, uh, I, I don't recognize the uh, existence of minds, of mental entities, uh, in any sense other than as attributes or activities on the part of physical objects, mainly persons. Now, uh, that must mean then that you not only reject idealism, it must also mean that you reject dualism. I mean, one might describe dualism as almost the common sense view. I think throughout human history, most human beings have taken the view that reality consists ultimately of entities of two categorially different kinds, minds and bodies. And as far as we know, in all civilizations, past and present, most people seem to have thought this, that there were bodies and that there were minds, and that these were two fundamentally different kinds of thing. Now, that's what is meant by the term dualism. That's... Now, you must reject this view if you don't believe in the existence of minds. It's true. I do, I do reject the view. Um, the, the, the dualistic view <clears throat> presents problems, creates problems which are uh, neither... Uh, uh, soluble, nor, it seems to me, <clears throat> necessary. Uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> it, it's clear that, that a, a, an individual's decisions uh, will affect his movements, will determine his movements in many cases, and his movements in turn will, uh, uh, will uh, have consequences in the movements of other physical objects. Uh, at the same time, the um, um, natural scientists, the physicists, um, uh, uh, insist on a, a uh, uh, closed system, there being physical causes, physical explanations in principle for, uh, for the physical events, 
that they allow no place for the incursion of influences from outside the physical world. Uh, given all this, it would seem then that uh, a person's decisions must themselves be uh, activity on the part of a physical object. Uh, the uh, alternative uh, of um, rejecting the, this basic uh, um, principle of, the, of, of physical science to the effect that uh, every change is, that there's no change without a change in the distribution of microphysical properties over space-time, over, over space. Um, that alternative I find uh, uh, uncongenial uh, because the uh, uh, successes in natural science have been such that we must uh, take their presuppositions very seriously. In other words, what you are saying is that, that wishes, emotions, feelings, decisions, thoughts are all things which take place in physical objects, namely people. Yes. And of course, in a sense, that's an obvious fact. And what you're saying is that not only are these always accompanied by microphysical changes, changes in our brains and our central nervous systems and so on, but they indeed are those microphysical changes. Exactly. Now, before I go on to uh, raise with you some of the apparent difficulties inherent in that view, I wonder if you can explain how it is that almost all of mankind, as I said only a few minutes ago, has disagreed with you about this. So why people in general take a dualist view of reality. Now, I mean, let me add this point. I mean, if I put that question to almost anyone else, he could say, well, it's obvious why people think like that. They think like that because dualism corresponds to directly experienced reality. That is how we experience things. But you can't say that because you don't think it is how we experience things. So what would your answer be? Uh, I, uh, I recognize uh, certainly a, a, uh, a profound difference between uh, so-called mental events um, <clears throat> uh, 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 and uh, uh, externally observable physical ones, uh, in, uh, in spite of construing these mental events as uh, themselves uh, 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 event states activity on the part of a physical object. The reason, uh, and as, as for the, the traditional dualistic attitude, uh, certainly this goes back to primitive times. I think uh, one cause uh, of it uh, partial explanation may uh, be the uh, experience of dreams and the seeming separation of the of the the uh, 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 mind from the body. Uh, in that state, um, uh, certainly uh, animism antedated uh, uh, science. Thales, the first of the Greek philosophers, is said to have said that all things are full of gods. Primitive people uh, peoples today are uh, said to uh, be. Uh, uh, animists uh, uh, very largely and to believe that uh, what we call inanimate objects are are animated by uh, spirits the um, uh, one, one can even imagine traces of animism in the uh, basic concepts of of our science itself the notion of cause I suspect uh, uh, began with the feeling of effort of pushing on the part of the individual, the subject of feeling, the, uh, um, uh, as, a, as a mental uh, uh, entity. And force surely had that sort of origin. But as uh, time has gone on and as science has progressed in, uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, recent centuries, uh, the, the dissociation of uh, these concepts from their original a, 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 a mental uh, context uh, seems to have been uh, conducive to to a great scientific progress uh, and uh, I think of the I think of physicalism as a departure a product of uh, uh, latter-day science which of course is a phenomenon that's a very uh, uncharacteristic of the, uh, uh, the history of mankind but I don't think that the chief reason why most people take a dualist view of reality is to do with dreams or the other things that you've mentioned. I think it's chiefly because we all do have, uh, it seems to me, direct experience of an internal flow of thoughts and emotions and responses and desires and fantasies and memories and so on, which is going on all the time that we're awake and which is extremely complex, not only in the sense that it may be about complicated things, but also in the sense that there may be several different things going on at once. 
And I think we're all directly aware of something like this going on inside ourselves. And this doesn't manifest itself in any way in observable external no. behavior. We, we are aware of these things, uh, and, and, um, uh, and I'm not denying their existence, but I'm construing them or reconstruing them uh, as uh, activities on the part of uh, physical objects, uh, uh, namely on our part. Uh, and um, the, uh, the, the fact that these are not observable on the whole from the, uh, from the outside uh, doesn't uh, uh, distinguish them from uh, much that the physicist assumes in the way of internal microscopic or submicroscopic structure of uh, inanimate objects. A great deal goes on that we don't uh, observe from the outside and that we uh, have to account for conjecturally. Uh, the, uh, uh, import the important reason for uh, construing all this activity as activity on the part of bodies uh, is to uh, uh, preserve the, the uh, closed uh, the character of uh, the system of the physical world. Does this mean that you deny the real existence of the age-old problem about whether or not we have free will? It doesn't mean that, but I, I, uh, um, because uh, uh, the will would retain its, uh, uh, its status, even though uh, uh, becoming a, a ultimately a, a, a neural phenomenon uh, and uh, a, 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 an aspect of the activity of a physical object. However, I think the problem of the freedom of the will uh, is an outcome of a, of a confusion. Uh, there's no question in my mind uh, about the freedom of the will. Uh, uh, the, the will is free uh, in the sense that uh, people very often uh, do what they will to do. Uh, they are free uh, to within limits of uh, uh, constraint and to the, within limits of their, their uh, strength or talent to do things that they will to do. Freedom of the will does not mean that the will is free to will as it will. That would be nonsense. And it doesn't mean that the will is uncaused. The will is caused. And we all uh, are prepared to recognize that the will is caused when we uh, try to train children in such a way as to influence their behavior uh, or enact laws to uh, discourage criminals. Or we, uh, we try to get, you try to get votes People try to sell things. All these are cases of uh, of cause, causing uh, people to will, but their the freedom of their will remains insofar as their activity uh, is the result of a causal chain, one link of which is the willing, and that willing can be itself caused. It is. How, given that you hold these views, how do you see the traditional body-mind problem? I mean, let me just remind our viewers of what that is. I mean, I've said earlier that most people seem to take a dualist view of reality, uh, the view that everything in the universe consists ultimately of either minds or bodies, that there are both kinds of entity. And that has given rise to a traditional problem, which no one has ever come up with a thoroughly satisfactory solution to. And that is the question, how are these incorporeal, abstract, non-material minds able to actually move and push about the material bodies? Now, it's clear that you, since you don't believe in the existence of minds as independently of bodies, the problem does not present itself to you in that form. Do you, uh, given your views, do you simply bypass the mind-body problem totally? Um, <clears throat> no. Um, uh, as you say, the body-mind uh, the, uh, the body problem doesn't exist in that form for me. Mm. Uh, there's no longer that problem of, of interaction. And in fact, it's uh, in order to eliminate the problem in that form uh, that, I, uh, 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 that I opt for physicalism. Uh, however, the problem then arises... Um, how are we to talk about all these uh, ordinarily so-called mental events and mental activity, uh, all, uh, this flux of experience, um, uh, if we're not recognizing minds, not recognizing mental entities? Um, it's no good uh, trying to paraphrase all this into uh, neuro neurological terms because uh, it would take too much in the way of detailed uh, uh, understanding of the mechanism of the nervous system. Now there's a there's a 
as a first step, a quick, easy solution to that. Uh, one uh, may simply keep the mentalistic terminology, but regard all these terms as terms applicable to bodies and to the activity of bodies. This is easy, this is too easy in a way, uh, because there's another point about the, uh, uh, in favor of the physicalistic attitude, which uh, uh, I haven't uh, touched on up to now, namely the advantage of intersubjectivity, objectivity. Uh, the data uh, are not introspective data, the data are shared, or can be shared by other observers. Uh, it's because of this, uh, uh, in large part at least, that uh, that the natural sciences have been so successful. Now, uh, and uh, and introspective psychology has not been comparably successful. Well, now, if we simply take over all the conceptu uh, con uh, conceptual apparatus of introspective psychology and mentalism, uh, and uh, simply try to excuse it by saying all these uh, attributes or uh, activities of bodies, uh, we're no longer getting the benefit of the intersubjectivity of, of natural science. However, there's a, there's a way of coping with this difficulty, and it is behaviorism in the sense in which I think behaviorism is important and, and valuable. I think its role, the role of behaviorism um, is the legitimation of mentalistic terms of, without having to go through the, the uh, uh, indirect and, in fact, impracticable uh, 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 channel of, of neurology. Um, criteria, observable, intersubjectively observable criteria for mental states uh, are found um, in behavior, in observable behavior. And that uh, would include verbal behavior. What including verbal behavior, yes. yes. And insofar as such criteria are available, uh, we do have the uh, benefits of, uh, of natural science after all, and this is without uh, 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 full neurological explanation. So the, sense, uh, the extent to which I'm a behaviorist is uh, uh, in seeing behaviorism as a way of making objective sense of mentalistic concepts. I don't identify the mental states with the behavior. I identify the mental states rather with uh, uh, neural states, uh, nor do I regard uh, uh, behavioral accounts as, uh, in the last analysis, explanatory of the mental uh, states, mental phenomena. I think that the full explanation of these is to be found rather at the neurological level. In other words, you're saying that behaviorism is not an explanation of the kind of problems with which the philosopher deals, but a way of formulating them. I mean, it's a kind of language in which the problems should be uh, couched or formulated before we then go on to try and provide solutions. Exactly. Yes. yes. I think it would be helpful uh, if we paused a moment at this point, Professor Quine, and, and if I try to recapitulate uh, the ground that we've covered before we attempt any forward moves. Um, I started this discussion by asking you what you regarded as the as the central tasks of philosophy, and you you not only said what you thought philosophers ought to be doing, you also said what you thought they ought not to be doing, and you ruled out a number of questions. But you you grouped the questions that you thought philosophers ought to concern themselves with under two main heads. The first head being questions about what exists, what does reality consist of. And the second group being, what can we know about this, and how can we know, and what can we say about it, and so on. Now, from that point onwards, we've been pursuing the first of those uh, those two uh, groups of questions. And you said that, in your view, your view of reality is physicalist. You think all reality consists in physical entities, that there are not minds separate from physical entities, and that the notion that there are leads us into all sorts of conceptual confusions, which you think... Uh, a behaviorist analysis liberates us from. I'd like us now to to start going over to questions of the second kind because we were beginning to get into them already, and that's why I thought it time to stop and, and reassess where we were. Uh, can we now move into the second area of how we acquire knowledge of this physical world in which we find ourselves? Good. Um, 
the one one uh, um, correction I uh, uh, would make, though, um, my position is not that there are only physical objects. There are also abstract objects. But these abstract objects are not mental. It's important to but make that distinction, mental. isn't it? That's you it. don't believe in the existence of minds as separate from physical things, exactly. but you do believe in the existence of certain abstract entities. Yes, like numbers them. notably. But I think you need to explain that a bit. If you are a physicalist, how can you justify your belief in the existence of abstract entities at all? The... Um, Status of uh, sets or classes and numbers and functions, uh, I think, uh, from the again, not, not from the uh, point of view of the predicative side of philosophy, uh, is uh, uh, not basically different from the status of hypothetical entities in the, uh, such as elementary particles in physics. Uh, in both cases, uh, it's a matter of framing hypotheses uh, which uh, uh, imply our, our past observations, uh, which imply future observations under, uh, under uh, 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 specifiable conditions, uh, which uh, would uh, uh, then serve to corroborate or uh, refute these hypotheses. And these general hypotheses uh, uh, re contain reference not only to the ordinary, uh, ordinary observable objects, but also to many auxiliary objects, we might say, uh, in the way of unobservable physical particles, and also in the way of numbers and functions, because these come into the formulations, into the hypotheses of a quantitative kind. And even classes or sets, uh, the, uh, the biologist uh, speaks of uh, genera and species of, uh, of, uh, of uh, organisms. And all these entities are uh, uh, Furniture of the uh, of the world uh, posited uh, on an equal footing in our system of the world. Well, you say on an equal footing, but it does seem to me that there is a very important difference between the sense in which subatomic particles are unobservable and the sense in which, say, numbers are unobservable. And subatomic particles are bits of stuff, but it just so happens, perhaps because of the accident of our optical apparatus, that they're bits of stuff which are too small for us to see. But if we had microscopic eyes or super microscopic eyes, perhaps we could see them. And if we had different kinds of fingers, we could pick them up. I mean, they are bits of material. But numbers aren't bits of material, however small, are they? I mean, they are, as it were, abstract through and through. There is nothing but abstraction to them. Uh, it's true. They, 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 there's this discontinuity. But the continuity of ordinary observable objects with the... Uh, uh, with Elementary particles uh, uh, is uh, rather more tenuous than uh, had once been supposed, because an elementary particle is too small, for instance, uh, even in principle, to be uh, uh, detected by by uh, light because it's uh, because it's uh, uh, s smaller than any uh, uh, any wavelength. Uh, furthermore, uh, the behavior of the elementary particles is, is basically unlike that of uh, uh, larger uh, uh, bodies, so much so that it's, uh, I think, only by courtesy that they're called uh, material. Um, the, uh, the indeterminacy with respect to whether uh, two segments of the uh, uh, two segments of paths of an electron are segments of paths of the same electron or two different ones, uh, indeterminacy. Uh, uh, indeterminacies of, uh, uh, of position, the the uh, antithesis between wave and corpuscle as a uh, uh, in the interpretation of light, uh, and uh, other anomalies, something called the Bose-Einstein uh, statistic, uh, all uh, suggest that uh, um, the analogy of body uh, is an analogy that was useful for extrapolation up to a point, but then the uh, uh, the reshuffling, the, the evolution of hypotheses in the light of further experimentation and further refutations uh, have uh, finally uh, carried us to the point where uh, these, uh, where, where the, the continuity is no longer so evident. I, I would like to leave uh, that particular point there, Professor mm -hmm. Klein, because I want to step back three paces in our discussion and take up something which strikes me as being of very much more general interest that we were talking about a moment ago, and then we got slightly...
sidetracked, and I think it was partly my fault that we did. Uh, I want to go back to the point where you were saying, or suggesting anyway, that the adoption of a physicalist approach to reality or a behaviorist analysis, a behaviorist way of formulating problems, has the effect of liberating you from the spell of certain entrenched ways of looking at things, which though they may be part of common sense, are nevertheless mistaken. Now that's the point I want to take you up at. Can you say what some of the entrenched ideas are from which you believe your approach would liberate us? Good. Um, liberation is one way of looking at it. Uh, a sterner discipline is another way of looking at behaviorism. Uh, but at any rate, uh, a, a uh, major example is the notion of meaning. Uh, the, um, um, there's the common sense notion that words somehow convey meanings. How do we know that, these, that the same words convey the same meaning to two uh, speakers? We can see that the speakers react in the same way. All this is describable in behavioral terms. But might the meanings themselves be different? What behavioral sense can be made of the question? No behavioral sense, no adequate behavioral sense has been made of it. Uh, there are um, other uh, notions that uh, come similarly into question. Translation. Uh, once the notion of meaning is questioned, uh, the um, notion of translation becomes more complex. We can no longer say it's simply a matter of producing another another sentence that has the same meaning as the sentence that's being translated. Um, the, the, um, the notion of necessity, again, uh, comes into question. Um, um, the well, there are two kinds of necessity, there are two aren't there? kinds, yes. The, Logical and causal. Yes, the one uh, commonly is uh, understood as necessity by virtue of the meanings of the words. Mm. The sentence is true by virtue of the meanings of the words that it contains. Uh, this uh, characterization uh, goes by the board if the notion of meaning does. Uh, then there's the uh, uh, notion of physical necessity, uh, necessity by virtue of physical law. Uh, this doesn't depend in the same way on meaning, but by somewhat the same sort, sort of scruples, uh, it also uh, uh, becomes uh, uh, questionable. The... Uh, um, It's not clear that there's a uh, not clear to me that there's a difference between um, a general truth, a truth in the form of a general proposition, general statement, um, uh, which uh, uh, just happens to be true, and one that is a law. The uh, uh, the, the term. Necessary, the adverb necessarily, uh, is in uh, very common use and that uh, suggests that perhaps uh, people have a distinction in mind between two sorts of truth, the necessary and the accidental or contingent. But I think the uh, use of the, uh, of the ordinary use of, uh, of that word can be explained otherwise. I think it's, uh, it's dependent on situation, on context. One uh, says necessarily and follows it with a sentence. But when he, th when he thinks that the other person is uh, bound to admit it because of what he already has committed himself to or because he may be presumed to believe, uh, and uh, uh, that uh, uh, this will vary with the context. So you're calling into question such very fundamental notions of our thinking as uh, causal necessity, logical necessity, the idea of a law, uh, the notion of meaning, Yes. The ground is beginning to disappear from under our feet. And I think what I would like to do at this stage, uh, Professor Quine, is ask you to uh, characterize for us as a whole the kind of view of the world that we're coming out with. Uh, can, can, can you... Good. Well, now uh, let's proceed again by the, uh, in terms of the, that dichotomy between the ontological and the predica uh, predicational. Um, on the ontological side, uh, uh, what I am... Uh, accepting, assuming, uh, rise physical objects, a physical object being construed quite uh, generously as uh, the content of any portion, however scattered and discontinuous, of space-time, uh, and all 
classes of such things and all classes of such classes and so on. Uh, and mathematicians have uh, known, uh, have discovered during, over the past century, how uh, all talk of numbers and functions and all other mathematical uh, 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 entities can be paraphrased into talk of the pure set theory of the classes. Uh, classes, classes of classes, appropriate ones can be uh, uh, made to do the work of numbers and of functions and the rest. So we need these. On the other hand, these are abstract objects that I accept. There are others that I would reject. Properties, I would reject because there's the question of, there's the question, in what circumstances do two descriptions, two characterizations determine the same property uh, and uh, in what circumstances do they determine different properties which just happen to be properties of all the same things. The problem in, ter in, in chart of individuation, of identification of properties. And it's ordinarily <clears throat> said that two, two clauses, let's say, two phrases, uh, determine the same property if they have the same meaning. Uh, but of course this characterization goes by the board if we don't accept the notion of meaning. Uh, in the case of classes, this problem of identification does not arise because classes are, are identical simply if they have the same members. Uh, properties, I, I'm persuaded, are dispensable in uh, science. It's not clear how to dispense with the classes. So this uh, would be my tentative ontology, and I would regard it as part of science and subject to the fallibility of the rest of science, namely the individuals and the hierarchy of classes and classes of classes and so on built upon them, the individuals being physical objects. On the, um, on the predicative side, uh, uh, my view is, I think, mainly or rather uh, 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 negative. It's one of, uh, of rejecting uh, uh, predicates that, uh, that have too little in the way of, of behavioral or let's say of, uh, of observable uh, criteria for their application or failing that uh, I think one one must also accept theoretical predicates which uh, don't admit of observable of observational criteria but there one must insist on there being uh, pretty firmly related to uh, uh, predicates of the observa uh, ob observational kind uh, through laws hi uh, hypotheses better, uh, general uh, uh, physical theory, uh, which makes for uh, a, uh, a well-knit system of the world uh, which uh, uh, expedites prediction. So that I, I would uh, uh, insist not that predicates have, a, uh, uh, have, have necessary and sufficient uh, conditions in observation. Uh, but that they have a good share in the way of, obser of observable um, criteria, symptoms of, uh, of application, uh, or that they uh, uh, play a quite a promising role uh, in the theoretical hypotheses. One thing that pleases me very much about the discussion that we've had is that none of it so far has been specifically about language or about words. And I say that because uh, a lot of intelligent laymen uh, uh, who begin to take an interest in philosophy uh, are sometimes put off by what they take to be the discovery that modern philosophers are doing nothing but talking about words, talking about terms, uh, analyzing sentences, statements, and so on. And you haven't talked in that way at all, and it's quite clear that the problems with which you are concerned are not problems about language. Nevertheless, uh, someone opening your books uh, or a student coming to study with you at Harvard for the first time would find that a great deal of your technique of approach to these problems is via uh, the analysis of concepts and therefore careful attention to words, the elucidation of sentences and statements and so on. Um, why is it that you and other contemporary philosophers adopt this linguistic approach to what are, after all, essentially non-linguistic problems? One, one reason is a strategy that I call semantic ascent, A-S-C-E-N-T. Um, philosophical issues uh, are often concerned with very fundamental traits of one's conceptual scheme, 
And if two philosophers disagree on such points, uh, it's difficult for them to discuss their disagreement without each of them begging the question, because it's hard to reason and argue without uh, making use of the fundamental principles of one's own conceptual scheme. And a way of avoiding or, or uh, uh, somewhat uh, 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 minimizing this difficulty uh, is uh, uh, the device of moving up one step semantically and talking about words instead of using the words to talk about the things. Uh, and if one makes this move, then one can talk about the rival systems as systems of sentences. One can compare them in point of simplicity and uh, uh, in point of uh, inclusiveness uh, and uh, uh, make a judgment on a, uh, on a shared basis without the uh, uh, circularity. The question begging. Well, we're coming to the end of our discussion now, Professor Crime, but I would like, just before we do literally end, I'd like to ask you if you can say anything at all, uh, perhaps in the light of the discussion we've had up to this point, about what you are currently working on. I, I, I have to ask you to be briefer than I would like, because we have so little time left. But I would like you, before we end, to say something about what you're doing original work on now. Well, um, at, at present, I'm, uh, uh, I've been uh, writing short things in an effort to elucidate some of the points already in my, uh, in my other writings, or to extend and improve them. Uh, but uh, there are several uh, pr problems on which I would like to see someone make breakthroughs. Uh, one of them is connected with language, uh, namely uh, the development of some conceptual scheme to take the place of the untenable, old-fashioned theory of meaning. Uh, something new and uh, uh, something more acceptable in the way of uh, theory of what goes into good translation, for instance. Um, this is a, a, a job perhaps for linguists, but uh, it's something of a philosophical interest, and it's a job also where someone with a philosophical curiosity is apt to be uh, helpful to the linguist. A second one uh, is related rather to psychology. Uh, I should like to uh, see a, concept, a system of concepts developed uh, which would do the work of the old mentalistic idioms of propositional attitude. Uh, X believes that P, X regrets that P, X hopes that P, this sort of thing. These idioms are subject to some subtle logical uh, difficulties and com complications, and they're very wanting, in large part of their applications, wanting in adequate behavioral criteria. I should like to see, for sci not for general discourse, but for scientific purposes, uh, some apparatus uh, which would uh, uh, be, uh, which would serve the same purposes as these and be free of those faults. The third is related rather to mathematics. Uh, the uh, somewhat, somewhat begrudgingly, one I accept, I accept um, uh, the apparatus of uh, uh, abstract objects, sets, and the rest um, uh, as an auxiliary to science because it seems to be needed. Uh, but I should like to see a a a, a minimum basis, uh, an economical basis, uh, and, a, 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 and, a, and a very clear, clearly intelligible basis uh, for, uh, for set theory, uh, which uh, was adequate, just barely adequate, uh, to so much mathematics as is needed in natural science. And it might be that uh, uh, if this were developed, it would, among other things, uh, uh, give us a more intuitive uh, uh, understanding of the so-called paradoxes, the antinomies of set theory and their solutions, such things as Russell's paradox, which uh, are familiar to some of our viewers, uh, uh, I'm sure, and not to all, so that might be a good place to stop. Well, we will have to stop. Thank you very much, Professor Quine.